Amen? Amen. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts, if you would, please. The book of Acts, chapter 4. I hope you guys are good to be challenged today. I hope, I hope that's all right, because I, I feel like today is a, a bit of a challenging kind of a message, um, which, of course, is a wonderful thing, because we come to be challenged, we come to hear from God, amen? amen. And when we hear from God, that doesn't always equal a warm and fuzzy, tell me how great I am, God. A lot of times, what we need to hear from God is, hey, I love you, but, do you know what I mean? I love you, but I love you too much to leave you where you're at. Acts chapter 4, we're not making any headway today. I'm just letting you know that right now. We're making a little headway. We're going to read two extra verses today, but they're two very big verses. We're, we're still going forward, but we're not going very far. I do want to re, reread a few from last week. Start, so we're going to start reading in Acts chapter 4, verse 5. Acts chapter 4, verse 5 says this, And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexandra, Alexander, excuse me, and as many as were of the family of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. Now, just to make sure we're all on the same page here, Peter and John had went to the temple, heal the beggar. They get asked, uh, you know, in what, by what power, how did you do this? It's in the name of Jesus. So they're boldly speaking the name of Jesus like we ought to be doing today. It's all about Jesus. Amen? It's all about Jesus. We've got to bring it back to Jesus. And that's what Peter and John were doing. So they end up getting arrested. They get put in jail. They're in jail overnight. Now we are on that next day where Peter and John now are being brought before the Sanhedrin, that governing council of the Jewish people. They're brought before these leaders to be questioned about this. So verse 7, it says, And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Have you healed this man? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel. We're not ashamed to say this to anybody. We want everybody to know this. You you religious leaders and all of the people of Israel, all of the Jewish people, we want everybody to know this. Do you understand that's what Peter's saying right here? That's, That's his statement. We want everybody to know that it is in the name of Jesus, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified... Let me, let me get you, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. By him, this man stands before you whole. And, if, and you guys, I want to remind you of this before we get to this new, these new verses today. Last week, our focus was on our need for the Holy Spirit and, and that we ought to be trusting in the Holy Spirit, that we ought to be trusting in him to give us the words and the wisdom, the boldness and the courage to speak the name of Jesus, to testify about the name of Jesus, to share the name of Jesus. Because too many of us feel like we are unqualified, ill-equipped to share the gospel, to share our faith. Many of us, we feel that prompting. You could even be, you, you could be standing in the grocery store talking to somebody, and they can be telling you about a difficult time. You feel that prompting like I do. Listen, like I do, you feel the prompting inside that says, I want to pray for this person. But how many of us, we, we get that as like, gosh, you know what? I, I want to pray with you. And, I, and this is all going on inside. And then we walk away and we don't pray with them. And a lot of times that's because we're, we're afraid. What if... What if What if I say it wrong? What if I do it wrong? What if somebody sees me? We have all of these real life natural things that inhibit us, that keep us from praying. But y'all, when I said that, the number of heads that nodded, it's like, yeah, I feel that prompting. I want to pray with this person. Listen to me. That's the Holy Spirit. I believe that's the Holy Spirit prompting you, pray with this person. And at that point, church, I, I can't encourage all of us enough, again, myself included, to trust in the Holy Spirit. Trust the promise of God that as a believer, 
When we ask, we are filled with the Holy Spirit, that He gives us the words and the wisdom. Remember, Jesus said that to the disciples. I will give you words and wisdom. I will equip you. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, has what it takes. All of a sudden, the same guy that couldn't acknowledge he knew Jesus, he's got the chutzpah to all of a sudden challenge the religious people and say, not knowing what the consequences could be, but he's got what it takes to say, listen to me, you leaders and all the people of Israel, I want you to know one thing. And that one thing is this. It is in the name of Jesus that this man is healed. You see, church, we, we have to make sure it's all about Jesus. People need to know Jesus. The one name under heaven by which we are saved. People need to know Jesus. And we are equipped. He gives us what we need to do what he asks. We need to trust that. Amen? If we, could, if we keep reading, we get to verse 11. Verse 11 says this. It says, this is the stone. So Peter is still in this conversation. I break this up sometimes, but I want you to understand, this is all still happening in the same conversation. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. We're going to stop right there. Here's what Peter, he continues with this same message. Honestly, this message is nothing different than what we've been talking about. And the reason that this message keeps coming up is because it's what the Bible says. What Peter is saying, he's, he's, he's reiterating, and he's actually quoting this Old Testament prophecy. It comes from the Psalms, it comes from Isaiah, where the Bible says the, the, the stone the builders have rejected, who's the stone that's rejected? Jesus. Jesus. Has become the chief cornerstone. Who's the chief cornerstone? Jesus is. And so this is what he's doing. Once again, Lou, as he's bringing it back to, this is all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. People don't need to know the name of the church you go to unless it's Maranatha Chisago Lakes campus. Then they need to know the name of the church you go to. They don't need to know the denomination you belong to. You know what people need to know? People need to know Jesus because there's no other name under heaven by which we are saved. It is only Jesus. You guys, that's why this message keeps coming up in our church because we're just reading the Bible. And what does the Bible keep telling us? It's all about Jesus. There's no other name under heaven by which we are saved. None. There's one name under heaven whereby we must be saved. There's one name. And that name is not Billy Graham. That name is not Toby Mack. That name is not Mercy Me. That name is not Joel Osteen or Stephen Furtick or Bill Headley or Mike Hasseltine. That name is Jesus. Now, church, we can never, ever forget that. Amen? There's one name. And that's what Peter keeps coming back to. There's one name that people need to know. It's the name of Jesus. Now, this, this prophecy that... Peter quotes here, this, this keeps coming up throughout the Bible. And here, I just want to show you what this means a little bit. The stone the builders rejected, they rejected him, and we're going to get into that, but he's become the chief cornerstone. And to, to those of you that are in construction at all, you know what this, this chief cornerstone is. This cornerstone, it's the most important stone in the structure. It's the stone by which everything else is leveled and plumbed off of. That's what the cornerstone is. I, I used to, uh, when I was growing up, we had neighbors, had a friend, and, and his dad worked for a block company. Anybody ever heard of Anchor Block? Anch yep. What, I can't believe all you people know what Anchor Block is. That's, that's unbelievable. Last night at, at the 430 service, I said, anybody heard of Anchor Block? Gina Johnson. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm like... She's a nurse. How in the world do you know about this block company? 
That's crazy. I forgot my point now. <laughs> oh, yeah, so he worked at this block company. And so one of the things he did was, one of the things he did was he made these line holders. And the, the whole purpose of the line holder, the way it was designed, was it, it would lock onto the top of a cinder block. And then it would run across, so you'd put it on one of the corner blocks, and you'd run it across to the other corner block. And then what you had was a line to build the rest of the structure on. That line is completely worthless, worthless if that cornerstone is not where it needs to be. Secure, level, in the right spot. That's the chief cornerstone. And that's what Peter's saying here. He's saying the stone that you rejected, listen, has actually become the chief cornerstone. The stone on which everything else needs to be built. And I want you to write down a few scripture verses today, if you would, because I want you to this week, maybe just a little bit of homework for you. I want you to go and read a little bit about, it's the same phrase, you guys, but it's said multiple times in the Bible, which to me should tell us like, okay, hey, kind of a big deal. Right, Dick? It's kind of a big deal. By the way, did you guys see Dick's mustache? That's, that's coming in nice, man. That's good. Psalm 118, verse 22. Jot that down. Psalm 118, verse 22. That's what Peter's quoting here. Isaiah 28, 16. Jot that down. Go back and look at that. This statement, Jesus actually refers to this Old Testament prophecy multiple times in the Gospels. So, so here again, part of why I want you to do this is because I always want to push us to the place where we see that the Bible is all about Jesus. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible is constantly pointing us back to Jesus. God's plan of redemption. God's plan of reconciling us sinful people to himself through Jesus. And it's all throughout the, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Paul quotes this in the book of Ephesians. Peter quotes this in his first book, in 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, these guys continue to make this statement. The stone the builders have rejected has become the cornerstone. And then there, so there's, then there's this idea of, of, of Jesus being rejected, right? The stone gets rejected. The stone that you builders have rejected. And I want to just talk about quickly this idea of, of this reject, rejection. Now, we obviously know that through the crucifixion, I mean, that's the, the, the most clear picture that they rejected Jesus as the Son of God, as the Messiah. They rejected that. They, they wanted to get rid of Him. But I want to show you in Scripture the things that they hated about Jesus. Turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. When I look at this stuff, what I think of is this, is I think all these religious leaders, what they did was they rejected Jesus as the Messiah, as the Son of God, as that stone, because he wasn't what they wanted him to be. He didn't fit into who they wanted him to be, what they wanted him to look like. In Mark chapter 2, I want to start reading in verse 13. It says this, then he went out again by the sea, and all the multitude came to him. Uh, this is Jesus. And he taught them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened, as he was dining in Levi's house, that many tax collectors and sinners, so Jesus, just so you all understand this now, Jesus is eating at Matthew's house with sinners. Got that? Okay. He was dining in Levi's house that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? 
And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So you have this group of very religious people, very careful who they spend any time with, and certainly who they're seen with, right? Can you imagine you guys walking into the bar? Of course, this is if any of you actually went to a bar. I know none of you ever do. Walking into a bar and I'm sitting there? Could you imagine that? Sitting at the bar having a glass of water? Yeah, well, Lou, you'd probably be with me if I was sitting at the bar. <laughs> We'd be there with our tinfoil. But it's that type of an idea. See, these religious people, they didn't like who Jesus was. They didn't like the things that he did because it didn't fit their mold. Their religious mold. It just didn't fit. Why is he spending time with sinners and tax collectors? Here's the deal. It's who he came for. Amen? Jesus died so that sinful people could be saved. The religious didn't like that, so they reject him. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew. Matthew, Back to the left a little bit. Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, starting in verse 27. Matthew chapter 3, 27. I hope today that, obviously, as we learn about the Lord, as we learn about what happened 2,000 years ago, I hope that the Holy Spirit is challenging you today. Because this has challenged me, like, like drive me crazy challenged me, this message. Listen, verse 27 of Matthew chapter 23 says this. Jesus is speaking. If you have a red letter Bible, that means these are Jesus' words. It says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, play actors. For you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Now here's the thing. Why are they rejecting Jesus? Because he's, he's upsetting them. He is calling them out. People didn't do that to these religious leaders. They, they feared these religious leaders. They revered these religious leaders. They didn't challenge them. And Jesus comes on the scene, and he is calling them on the carpet saying, wait a minute. You guys are like a whitewashed tomb. You're like a place where a dead guy gets buried. Because know this, they would paint and they would plaster the outside of these tombs and decorate them so they would look real nice. But on the inside, there's just a dead guy. Are you a dead mon? <laughs> Anybody ever see that? Yeah. No mon! <laughs> Did you know the Jamaican bobsled team? I think they made the Olympics this last year, by the way. <laughs> Here's the thing. On the inside of these tombs, as, as hard as they worked to try and make it look good, Jesus is saying to these religious people, you're just like that. Because you do everything to make it look good on the outside, but on the inside, you're unclean. You're sinful. You're a whitewashed tomb. They hated that. Who are you to talk to me that way? So they reject him. He doesn't look like, he doesn't sound like, he doesn't act like what they want him to. Instead of building on the cornerstone, which is Jesus, they're building their own thing. And when their own thing gets threatened, they don't want anything to do with the cornerstone. Does that make sense? Turn in your Bibles, if you would please, to the book of John, chapter 11. 11. John chapter 11, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John chapter 11. We're going to start reading in verse 45. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. John chapter 11, verse 45. Now this is something where this now, 
Again, we, we know these things, but just to kind of help us bring to the surface why it is this rejection. They did not like Jesus. They didn't like the challenge that he brought to their lives. So in John 11, verse 45, here's what the Bible says. It says, Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. So you have these Jewish people now, they're, starting to, they're following Jesus more and more. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees, they gathered a council, and they said, what shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. You see, here's what we got to remember. You have the Jewish people And they had their governing body, the Sanhedrin. All of that was still under Roman rule. The Romans were still in charge. The Romans let them do their thing as long as it was peaceful, as long as it doesn't doesn't cause trouble, all of these things. Their place, their position was being challenged because of who Jesus was. The life that they built. Here's what I want you to see is this. I want you to see that they built the life. Jesus is the cornerstone. They didn't build on the cornerstone. Instead, what they were doing, they were building their own life. And in their own building, they were feared and revered. They got the highest place of honor. When they walked into a room, it was a big deal. They had their flowing robes and their long tassels. They were looked up. I mean, all of these things. This is the world that they had built up. Now Jesus comes along and he's challenging every single aspect of that. And their selfish, sinful, greedy hearts were being challenged. Their position was being challenged. And if you keep reading, that what they do is they go on and say, it's better that one man should die. We need to kill him. They reject him. Listen to me now. Because he doesn't look, sound, act like, or approve. They reject him. Now this has to land at our feet, church. Because we've got to ask the question, well, what about us? What do, what do we do, listen to me, what do we do with the chief cornerstone? Because what the Bible is so clear about is that we need to be building on the cornerstone. Everything's built on the cornerstone. That's what the Bible is saying. What do you and I do when we are faced with the reality of who Jesus is? Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of John chapter 8. Back just a little bit. John chapter 8. Because what I want to try and do is this, and this is the part, you guys, where, 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 for me personally anywhere, this is the part where I get super challenged here by these, these ideas. Is Jesus the chief cornerstone of my life? Because that's, that's, that's the question, I think. Are, am I building my life on Jesus, am I, am I a Christian? I mean, that's really what it means, you know what I mean? It's like, am I a Christian? Or do I go to church? The best church. Am I a Christian or do I go to church? Am I serving God or am I serving me? Is my life about Jesus? Is my life about me? Am I building my thing or am I building his thing? Do you understand what I'm saying today? Is Jesus the chief cornerstone or not? Or am I rejecting him? That's really the question. Now, I want to pose two challenges to us, or if I could, two maybe areas of our life real quickly. John chapter 8, and I want to read a super familiar story to you. It's the story of the woman caught in adultery. But what I think this story does is challenges two aspects of our life that we need to address today. It says this, Everyone went to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning, he came again to the, into the temple, and all the people came in, and he sat down and he taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees, they brought to him a woman caught in adultery. Again, I want to make sure you see this. The scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, okay? 
That's who it is bringing this woman in. They brought him a woman caught in adultery, and they had set her in the midst, right there in front of him. They said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. They're trying to get him to come out directly against the law of Moses because in the Jewish circle, that's a bad thing to do. They said this to him, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and he said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first speaking to the religious people. And again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. Now listen, this is this first part of this challenge. I want to tell you guys something about me if I could. This challenges me because this is something the Lord has been working on me like, like sometimes painfully over the last five, six years. I used to be, sometimes I still can be, an unbelievably judgmental person. I, I can be these guys standing there, yet strike her down, you know, that can be me. And I'll tell you this, if I went back, let's say, eight, ten years in my life, I was the most harsh and judgmental person when it came to somebody getting a divorce. I would, I would look at them, especially somebody within the church. You're a Christian. Are you kidding me? You're getting a divorce? And I would just condemn and look down on. You're lazy. You're selfish. You don't care about your kids. You certainly aren't a Christian. I mean, I, that, listen, painful to say it, but this was what was inside of me. And then as you guys know, now you fast forward in my life, and I find myself walking through a divorce. And oh my gosh, the time I spent repenting, crying out to God, praying Psalm 51, begging God, please don't take your spirit from me. Not just because of getting a divorce, which is something I know God doesn't want that, but because of my judgmental heart, church. Looking down, just yesterday even, and still in me. Just yesterday, Denise and I were driving on Highway 61, uh, from Forest Lake heading towards Wyoming, and I, I saw somebody jogging on the bike trail. Which I don't understand when it's nice outside why you would jog, but that's a different story. <laughs> I see someone jogging on the bike trail, and it's like there's 300 mile per hour winds, and it's sleeting a little bit, and it's, it, it's like, I, I swear it was like 40 below a wind chill, you know? It was miserable outside, and there's someone jogging, and guess what starts running through my mind? What kind of an idiot are you? I mean, I know stupid people. This takes the cake. I mean, I'm, I'm just going along, but listen, immediately it was like the Holy Spirit chastised me inside because I, it's a funny thing, but it's still in me, you guys. And immediately what, I, what was brought to my mind was I'm the guy that puts a board across the open water so I can still get out on the ice and ice fish a couple last times. I'm the guy, I love bundling up and riding the motorcycle when it's like 38 degrees outside. I'm the guy that people look at and go, what kind of an idiot are you? That you're still out ice fishing. How, why would you ride your motorcycle when it's that cold? I'm that guy. But here's the thing. I'm the religious person that can so quickly throw the stone. Yet I'm so full of sin. Because I build on my, myself, church. What about you? You see, to build on the stone that is Jesus Christ means I want to follow Him. I want to have His heart. I want to minister like He ministered. 
And all too often, you guys, we are the first ones to line up to say, yeah, I'll throw stones. But not a single one of us ought to be. I'm not saying that we shouldn't challenge each other scripturally. The Bible says to do that, right? I think it's Proverbs 27, 17. Iron sharpens iron. One man should challenge another. Me and Mark disagree on something. Guess what? Me and Mark should talk about this. I shouldn't go tell five or six other guys what Mark is doing and how Mark is acting and what Mark did. Mark and I should talk about this. Now it's iron sharpening iron. The other way, it's religiousness being judgmental. Do you see the difference? Are we building on our stone or are we building on the cornerstone, which is Jesus Christ? But now there's another part to this story, I think, too. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay, let's keep reading a little bit then. So Jesus tells these religious people, let anybody you who's perfect go ahead and throw the stone. They realize they're not, so why would they be throwing stones? He goes on, um, and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Verse 10, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, then neither do I condemn you. Listen, listen. He says, go and sin no more. You see, this is the other part of this thing. A lot of us, we're building on our stone. We justify our sin. And again, I hate to say this, you guys have no idea how good I am at this. I'm good at this part. Because here's what I can do. Inside of me, inside of me is anger and hatred and bitterness and unforgiveness. And listen, these are things that God clearly says ought not to keep inside of me. Isn't that right? That's my understanding of what the Bible says. I could be very well wrong, but I think that's what the Bible says. You see, I think this is the dead man's bones. I can make it look good. See, this stuff just convicts me. I can make it look good, but there's dead man's bones in me. But I justify it. My anger, my bitterness, my unforgiveness, I justify it. Because it's, it's all deserved. But he says, Change that. To this woman who's caught in her sin, he says, change that. You see, that's what it means to me to build on the cornerstone that is Jesus Christ. It's to stop justifying my judgmental, my judgmentalism, my to stop justifying, do you guys understand what I'm trying to say? To stop justifying that piece, but also to stop justifying my sin. But to let His grace, His kindness, you see the Bible says it's His kindness that leads us to repentance. I don't condemn you, but leave your life of sin. And so church, I want to know this today. Are, are you like me? Is the Lord challenging you today? Is the, Lord, is the Lord working in you today in one of these areas to say, wait a minute, Jim, you're, you're building on the rock that you want to build on. I want you to build on my rock. I want you to build on me. Mike, you've done this great, but this isn't me. I want you to build on me. The, the cornerstone that is Jesus Christ it comes to Jesus. It comes back to Jesus. He is the cornerstone. 
He is the Messiah. He is the Savior. He is the Son of God. He is the one name under heaven by which we are saved. He's the one who took my place on the cross. He's the one whose blood is shed so that we can be washed clean. He's the cornerstone. He's the rabbi. He's the teacher. He, he is. And he always has been. Who is he to you is the question. Are we building on the cornerstone that is Jesus? And, and we're going to sing a closing song with you guys. And, and I, wanna, I want you to hear this one line. This, this, line of, this last line of the third verse when we get to it, I just think it's, it's this powerful moving verse. And it says this. Um, the whole verse, it says, When he shall come with trumpet sound, O may I then in him be found. Dressed in his righteousness alone. Listen, now here's what it says. Faultless, stand before the throne. Listen, church, it's because of Jesus that we will be able to stand before the throne washed clean. Righteous in his eyes. Not because of anything we do, but because of who he is. He is the cornerstone. And so today, as we contemplate our lives, and I hope the Lord is challenging us, as we contemplate our lives, man, let's just proclaim this. Christ alone is our cornerstone. Amen. Let's